السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So thanks again for coming everyone Today's lecture is entitled Why are they covered like that? Obviously it's speaking about Muslim women and it's asking about why hijab Why are the Muslim women covered? So realistically in this lecture we're going to be looking at inshallah hijab versus a woman not wearing hijab and being recognized or, or looked at only as a sexual object. And this is the situation with women in the West, those who are supposed to be, <laughs> the ones who are liberated, and the rest of the Muslim women are supposed to follow them. They are regarded as a sexual object because of the fact that they don't wear hijab, or more realistically, because they don't dress modestly. And we all know the idea that if, let's say there is a meeting, that is, uh, the, the, the woman is running and she walks into the meeting room and she's not wearing good clothing. She's wearing short skirts, she's wearing tight clothing, she's revealing, you know, her body. What do you think the men would think of her when she walks in? The minute she walks in, what is the first thing that comes to their mind? Do they think, mashallah, she looks intelligent. Uh, this is probably going to be a very productive meeting, very intelligent person. Or do you think the first thing they would notice would be her sexuality? How attractive she is, how and you, scantily clad she is, how not, she's not dressed well. Do you think that would be the first thing they notice? Or would they look past that and look and see, perhaps this is an individual, this is an intelligent person, this is an intelligent human being. No doubt everyone knows that they will look at her only as a sexual object. And they will not look at her as someone with brains. So this is the result of women being portrayed as sexual objects in commercials, in movies, in magazines, on the internet. The result is that people don't see them as, as humans. They see them first as a sexual object. Yeah? And uh, there were many studies that were done in this field, very interesting studies, in the university uh, in Brussels. They did a, a study no, using something known as inversion effect. Inversion effect is the human being's inability to recognize faces when the face is turned upside down. So you take a photo of a human being, turn it upside down, and it's harder for people to recognize the person or the individual. But if you invert an object, they recognize it quickly. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's an object, the minute you turn it, the picture upside down, you can immediately figure out what it is. But with faces, it's much harder. It's harder for the, the human being to recognize a face if it's turned upside down. So at the university in Brussels, they did this study with pictures of men and pictures of women and they inverted them, turned them upside down and they would have people, uh, test subjects, would look at these pictures and to see if they were able to recognize them or not. So it would be shown photos before then they would show them the same people again upside down to see if they can recognize them or not. And uh, human beings had a hard time, like I said, have a hard time recognizing people and faces if they're upside down. But no problem with objects, buildings, cars, when they're upside down. So they brought 78 men and they showed them pictures of women upside down. And it was hard for them to recognize, they, they showed them pictures of men, sorry. So 78 men were shown pictures of men upside down. And it was hard for them to recognize them because people don't recognize people upside down. So they had difficulty. Then they brought them pictures of women, inverted as well, upside down. And it was very easy for them to recognize the woman. We said that men can re or humans can recognize objects when they're inverted. So they recognized the woman, but they couldn't recognize the men. This study was done by non-Muslims. It wasn't done by a Muslim trying to prove hijab is the truth or anything like that. Okay, So they saw that... Uh, they had no problem seeing a woman upside down and recognizing her quickly. Just the same way they recognize an object. So they started to conclude that men view women as an object. Then in the University of Nebraska in the United States, they did the same thing. And their studies are kind of similar. And they showed that men tend to be perceived as persons. Men, other, other human beings, they see men as persons. And they found that women tend to be perceived as objects, as objects. 
The interesting thing about the study at the University of Nebraska is that they found that even women viewed and perceived other women as exactly the same way, in exactly the same way. And meaning other women saw women as objects as well. So what does that tell you? You can draw certain conclusions from this and you can make certain arguments, but we're arguing that the, that society has has objectified women so much and made them sexual objects to such a degree that even other women see them see each other as objects and not as persons and not as individuals also in the University of Nebraska they did another study with 83 students and they showed them pictures of human bodies and human uh, parts parts pictures parts of uh, human bodies and when the subjects uh, were, were, I mean, the subjects remembered the woman better when they were shown body parts of women. They remembered which person this belonged to, this arm belonged to, or this leg belonged to. They remembered very well when they were shown body parts of the women, and they had a harder time recognizing or remembering when they saw the men. They only recognized the men when they saw the picture of the entire body. But when they saw pictures of the parts, they, they recognized the woman as well quickly. So the scientists concluded that people see women as they, the same way they see inanimate objects and be, they linked basically the individual to the parts. So when they saw parts of the woman, they said, oh, I remember that, we saw this picture earlier, that's that woman. So they, they see women as inanimate objects. You understand? Okay. Anyways, Another study done in 1989, this is a, an older study at the University of Michigan in the United States as well. This study was done around 37 countries. So they're, they're trying to show that I mean, this is not just uh, in the West that women look, are looked at as sexual objects or objects more than people or persons. Mm -hmm. But they did this study in 37 countries and they went to parts of Asia and so on and they came with the same conclusion. conclusion. So someone might argue, see, this is not just a Western thinking. This is across the globe. People see women as objects. But that means what? You're really just giving us more evidence to say the woman should be covered. Because when they're not covered, it doesn't matter if it's Muslim lands or not. When they're not covered, you just look, that, you look at them as a sexual object. And you're trained to look at them that way through magazines and it doesn't matter which country you're in. You always see the woman, something to push a commodity. You know, you put a woman not dressed properly and you get her to sell whatever it is. It has nothing to do with what you're selling and you put a woman on it. You're selling a car, put a woman on it. Selling tires, put a woman on it. Selling hammers, power tools, put a woman on it. So you just see them as sexual objects in that way. What is the effect of this on the society? A number of effects. One of the things is that it, it creates this unrealistic expectation by men of what the woman should look like. And I think a lot of people know this. That people watch television, they look in the magazines, and they see these images of women who are airbrushed and photoshopped and they have makeup on and everything is making, making them look as glamorous as possible. So a lot of men then, this becomes their standard. That they expect the woman to look like that. And that's why that uh, brother who tries to get married, he wants her to look like the pe person in the magazine. Even the person in the magazine doesn't look like that. <laughs> they went through a lot of changes and a lot of technology to make them look like that. So the expectations there for men are, are, have been raised and they now have some incredible standards because of these unrealistic images that they see all the time. Uh, with women who are average or normal looking, they start to feel inadequate and less beautiful. So they start to feel less about themselves because this is what they're comparing themselves to. They compare themselves to these images that are not realistic. So these are from the problems that happen. As well as the uh, psychological disorders like anorexia, nervosa, bulimia, nervosa. And anorexia is when the woman will stop herself from eating. She sees herself overweight, even though she becomes skin and bones. She still doesn't eat. She's skin and bones, but when she looks in the mirror, she sees a fat person and she doesn't eat. She decreases her food intake severely. It's an illness and it's caused by this. The, this fake image that they have to look up to and uh, these are the standards of beauty now. Uh, and, and bulimia as well, the same thing. Bulimia is binge eating. The woman will eat a lot and feel very good and full. 
Then she'll go in and she'll put her يعني, finger into her mouth and vomit all that food out of fear of gaining weight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a story just to show you. I'm just going to tell the story to show how the standards have changed a lot. In the old days, if a woman was overweight, she was beautiful, right? Now, if a woman's overweight, people think, what is this? If she is thin, now this is the new standard for beauty. And uh, an interesting study was done. They showed that, they showed pictures of women to men. And they ranked, the, these men will rank the women on their beauty, scale of 1 to 10, whatever. But they, saw, they found out that men rank a woman higher in beauty if she's overweight. If the man's hungry, he sees her as more attractive. Why? <laughs> the psychologists say that the man believes that this woman has access to a lot of food. Yeah? And when, <laughs> when he's hungry, she looks more attractive to him. Yeah? And Muhammad, there could be some useful technique there for some women. And Muhammad, the point is, uh, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was, a, there was an effeminate man and he used to, he used to sit with the, the women and the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and he'd just chit chat with them. He was an effeminate man. He has no haja, no irba, no desire in women. So the Prophet ﷺ used to allow him to sit with women. And these types of men, they're allowed to sit with women as long as they don't start to notice the beauty of women and notice women's bodies. This is what they thought about this man until one day he's telling Abdullah the brother of Umm Salama, Umm Salama, the, 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 the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet Sallam, this is her brother, Abdullah. So this man, this effeminate man, effeminate man, uh, you, know, you know what it means, a man that's more on the softer side, if we can use that term, not gay, not gay, on the softer side. So he was telling Abdullah, the brother of Umm Salama, he was telling him that if you guys conquer a ta'if, then he starts to tell him about a specific woman. Go after her, marry her, يعني, or take her as your captive. فَإِنَّهَا تُقْبِلُ بِأَرْبَعَةِ عُقًا وَتُدْبِرُ بِثَمَانِيَةِ عُقًا And what's he saying? He says when she comes in the forward, يعني, facing you, she has four folds. And when she turns and goes the other way, she has eight folds. What does it mean, folds? Folds of fat. So he's describing to him a very beautiful woman. She's so fat that she has folds. You know how when you're fat and the skin folds like this and folds again and folds again and folds again. She has four folds of fat on the front and eight on the back. Yeah, and what, I can imagine what that looks like. Fold, 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 fold. That was a beautiful woman. He's telling him if you conquer a ta'if, go for that woman. That was beautiful. <laughs> I know like, most of you now are like, mm, mm. Right? Because it's not beautiful for you anymore because the standards have changed. Even not long ago in the 1940s and even in the 50s and even the 60s, the, 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 the Western idea of a beautiful woman was not extremely thin. This is more a very contemporary thing. And the standards have changed even يعني, because of the satellite dishes and, and popular culture and the movies spreading. The standards have changed even in countries where people يعني, saw being overweight as beautiful. I don't want to give examples and, and names of countries, but and I'm familiar with certain countries where uh, people saw the overweight women as very attractive. And then, just in, in 10 years or 15 years, all the, the, you know, the movies and the standards changed, and then everyone in that country changed as well. And their, with a the mark of beauty, has become something different to them. Anyway, so enough about overweight women. We move on, inshallah. Um, but anorexia, bulimia, all of this is from trying to look like that model that they see on television. Also, what happens with, with, uh, with this issue when women are looked at as sexual objects and not as people, not as a human being, you see an increase in violence or, or the acceptance, and you see an increase in the likelihood and the acceptance of sexual violence against women as well. They are not looked at as humans, they are looked at as objects. That's what you're trained all the time. Every magazine, every movie, every commercial, you see a woman. And she's shown for her beauty, not for her intelligence or something like that. I'm going to prove, inshallah, in a little bit, we're going to talk about how even... Well, okay, it's, not, it's coming here. That uh, this, is a, this is a phenomenon we have in America, where if a woman is effeminate, يعني, she looks like a woman. She has long hair, she has a soft voice, she's attractive like a woman. In America... We have a big problem accepting orders from a woman like this. And we have very big problems 
putting them in leadership positions. We never put them in leadership positions. Why? Because they're women. She's beautiful. She's a sexual object. How am I going to take orders from a sexual object? Um, she's going to tell me what to do. That's why, this is the argument we're making, if you examine uh, Muslim, uh, if you examine Western women in very high leadership positions, what do they look like? We'll start with what they call the Iron Lady, right? Margaret Thatcher. What did she look like? Short hair. She'll wear those suits, the, the women business suits or what have you. If you watched recently, they made some documentaries about her. If you watch the documentaries, in the beginning, and they'll show you some old recordings of when Margaret Thatcher came into, or was you know, appearing into this, in the limelight, she would speak in a high-pitched voice. And then the experts who were around her told her, don't speak in a high-pitched voice. It's not agreeable with men. So make your voice deeper. So now she cuts her hair short. She makes her voice deeper. Then they show you a clip of her later years and she makes her voice deep again. Then they show you a clip when she left politics and her voice is high again. You understand what's happening? Yeah? So her advisors are telling her, if you have a high pitched voice and you look like a woman and you have you know, long hair, men don't accept you like this. So you cut the hair short and this is what it means when a woman appears androgynous. Androgynous, يعني, she has qualities, يعني, male characteristics, short hair, whatever, broad shoulders, deeper voice, and that is more acceptable to the men. Why? Because if she looks like a woman, they see her as a sexual object. The only way to be accepted by them, she has short hair, makes her voice deeper. So she made her voice deeper and went into politics. When she left politics, she went back to her normal speaking voice. I don't have to do this anymore. So that's the example of Ma Margaret Thatcher. If you remember with Madeleine Albright, also, what's her description during the Clinton era? Short hair again, business suits, staring around like this, huh? looking very manly, right? Uh, if you remember Janet Reno and all the comedians in America would, would make fun of her and they would dress up like her and pretend, you know, act like a man. She had short hair again and she looked very much like a man, Janet Reno. Then you have Hillary Clinton when she was running against Obama some years ago. She was always being critiqued on the internet, on the news, that she is too stoic. Stoic, yani, she's like not, not very reactive, doesn't show much emotion. She's like this. They're always criticizing her. She's too stoic. She's too manly. She, again, she has short hair, wears these manly kind of clothes, either the suit and the pants or the suit yani, and the dress, like that. So they kept criticizing her, she's too manly, do we really want a woman who is not in touch with her feminine side, and all these critiques. One day, they said she choked, يعني she's about to cry in her speech. طبعاً, it looked to me, when I watched it, it looked like she's acting. Let's say she really choked. She's talking about how much she loves America, and she choked or pretended to choke a little bit. What happened next day in the newspapers and in the internet, do we really want a woman for a leader? She cannot control her emotion. Type make up your mind. Huh? When, she, <laughs> when she's holding her emotions, oh, she's like a man, she needs to be in touch with the feminine side. And then the minute she pretended to choke, look, she's not stable and how can she run a country? She's crying every five minutes. So, honey, there's just no way out for them. Then, of course, we also had Condoleezza Rice, but she was a real man. <laughs> That's the best I can say about her, him, whatever. Al-Muhim, you get the idea now. Why? Because we can't accept an effeminate looking woman in a leadership position. She has to look like a man before we accept anything from her. And they, uh, they try to appear this way. So we start to see then that uh, this oppression versus liberation, hijab versus taking off the hijab, it's actually the real enslavement. And these women cannot escape the fact that they're sexual objects. There is, uh, for those who are interested in reading this, it's really, I believe it's one of the most amazing articles. Yani. It's written by a non-Muslim. And if you want to find it online, just Google Chinese American hijab. Just do that, Chinese American hijab. It's uh, an article written by a Chinese American lady. She's not Muslim. She wore the hijab for a while. And then she writes about her experience when wearing hijab. Really, really amazing. She begins by talking about how she just came out of the, the barber shop or the, where the hair salon, right? She said, I cut my hair very short. She cut her hair very short on purpose. And she says, to appear androgynous, يعني, to have these male qualities or characteristics. 
And she said, I did that because I wanted to basically almost like cancel out my femininity. She doesn't want people to see her as being very feminine. So she told the, the, the hairdresser, cut my hair as short as possible. She said she cut her hair as short as possible. And, and I'm, of course, I'm paraphrasing and I'm summarizing here. And uh, she went out right after cutting her hair short like that. And some workers or some men, they whistled at her. And she's now trying to appear like a man. And they still whistled at her. She said, I found out the problem was not my femininity. The problem was my sexuality. Yeah. It's, you understand where she's going with this. Yeah, and if she covers her sexuality, that will bring out her femininity. But being feminine, yani, that's not the problem. She said, uh, then she, she put on the hijab. And she was amazed by how people, I mean, women pay attention to this. She said she was amazed by how people didn't look at her up and down because she was covering her body. She was covering her hair. People looked at her with respect. She said, I went to the masjid and there was a Muslim there and he called me sister immediately. He showed me a lot of respect. He asked me where I'm from. She said, I was from China. And he said, she said it didn't mean anything to him. It was okay that she was from China. It was no problem. She said, I felt very accepted and so on and so forth. At the end of the article, it's a very short article. At the end, she says, it was when, yeah, when she wore hijab, she says, I quote, it was my sexuality that I covered, not my femininity. You understand? When she's, yani she, dis, she learned now through her experience that when she wore hijab, she didn't cover the fact that she's a, a female. She didn't cover her femininity. She covered her sexuality. Then she says, the covering of the former allowed the liberation of the latter. Really incredible. The covering of the former, the covering of my sexuality allowed the liberation of my femininity. And this is the blessing that Muslim and the righteous Muslim women have that if they're covered, they're not looked at as sexual objects. They're looked at as persons, as people, as human beings. And we give a chance for their intellect, for their intelligence to shine through. But if a woman is wearing bad clothing and you look at her only in that way, you don't wait for her intelligence to shine through. She has to work 10 times as hard to show you that she's smart. And that's another thing that, uh, that experts are saying about these types of images is that certain groups of people, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with this, but in America, for example, blonde women, yeah, blonde women are regarded as not being very intelligent. Yeah? And there are always these blonde jokes and how dumb they are, and they're always, always blonde jokes. Yeah? So, uh, so they tell you that if a woman now is blonde, even if she's smart, she has to work against the stereotype. She has to work harder to prove that she's intelligent. I want to um, mention uh, some historical issues that happened that brought us to where we are today concerning the perception people have about uh, Islam. Before we do that, I need the argument that if you're covered, you are, uh, you are oppressed and it is not a good argument. And, and many people think this. But why is it that when they see a nun covered, they don't think she's oppressed. This is in the West, right? Non-Muslims. They see a nun covered and they don't think she's oppressed. They see an Orthodox Jewish woman covered and they also don't think she's oppressed. The minute the Muslim woman comes walking by, look at this poor woman, she's oppressed. She's forced to put this on, you know? Actually, in, in America, there have been women who would walk up to a, a Muslim in hijab and tell her, you don't have to wear that, uh, my dear. You're in America now. Thank you for telling me where I was. I was here for 15 years and I don't know where I am, Annie. Thank you. Okay, I know where I am and I choose to put this on. No one's forcing me to put it on. So, why is it that the Muslim one is oppressed, the others are okay, there's nothing wrong with them. They do, that, they do it out of choice. We want to understand the, the argument behind that. And we're saying that the argument that being covered is oppressed is not a good argument and should not be accepted by believing men or women when it's presented to them. Because if being covered means you are oppressed, that means being uncovered means that you're liberated. True? And whoever makes that argument to you, you can tell them, essentially, but we don't really say this, but you can say, well, you're not fully liberated, I see, at the moment. Why don't you liberate yourself some more? And because the more you uncover, the more liberated you are. And this is a true story that happened during one of the events where uh, there was a speaker, Muslim speaker, giving a speech to a group of Muslim students. There was a men to the right and women to the left. So a non-Muslim woman came walking in very angrily, yelling and interrupting the speech. It shows again, some strange mentality. 
This is a religious group and they're having their own event. What business is it of yours how they sit and how they cover? But this woman felt she had the right to say that. She walks into the room interrupting the speech, yelling and pointing to the Muslim woman. Why are they covered like that? You, you know what she's trying to say. She's trying to say, you have oppressed them and that's why you made them dress this way. And liberate them, right? She said, why are they covered like that? So the speaker said to her, well, you were born without clothing. Why are you wearing clothes right now? She said, modesty. She said, okay, well, modesty? More modesty. If your argument that putting on clothes is because of modesty, that means the more you cover, the more modest you are. If your argument is that the, you know, being covered is oppression and being uncovered is liberation, then you are not 100% liberated either, so you should give me any speech, right? And muhim. Taban, we don't really use this argument. Maybe just save it for a very extreme condition. Huh? Here at Fanar, maybe Dominic can use that or something. So, Ayaz as well. <laughs> okay, but so why is it that the Muslim woman is looked at uh, as being oppressed? We're going to look at what happened in the early days when the, first, uh, the early Christians first came into contact with Islam and the Muslims. All right? But before that, biblically, in the book of Genesis, when, according to the Bible, Adam ate from the tree, the blame is put on the woman. The entire blame is put on the woman. She ate from the tree and then she gave him to eat from the tree, right? Now, uh, even Adam in Genesis in the Bible, he tells, he says to God, the woman you put here with me, she gave me from the fruit. So the blame was put on the woman 100%. Well, in Islam, was the blame put on the woman? No. Was the blame put on shaitan? Was it? No. Never ever is the blame put on the shaitan in the Quran. Never. You know why? Because shaitan doesn't force you to do anything. If he forced you, then he would be blameworthy. But all he does is suggest. In the, in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ So Adam disobeyed his Lord. Adam disobeyed his Lord. Not the shaitan caused Adam or, or Hawa made Adam. Adam disobeyed his Lord. Because the blame was put on Adam a.s. And it wasn't put on the shaitan. And never ever is in the Quran is the shaitan blamed for sins. Why? Because he only makes suggestions to you. He doesn't force you to do things. That's even his argument on the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, he gives the argument that إِنَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي I have just, I made an offer to you or I made an, I, I passed on an invitation and you're the ones who responded. I didn't force you. Now, this is when the shaitan would be blameworthy. Imagine one day you're sitting, suddenly your hand goes like this. Like, what's happening? And your hand starts pulling you to the supermarket and then you start taking things and putting in your pocket. Ya khwana, help me. Wallah, I don't know what's happening here. I'm stealing, but I don't want to steal. Shaitan is taking your hand and putting it in your pocket. You're making you, making you steal. Then he can be blamed for your sins, am I correct? If he forced you to do something, but he doesn't. He says, hey, why don't you do this? And you go do it. Whose fault is that? So the, the, the sin in the Quran was never blamed on Hawa and never blamed on Iblis. But Adam was responsible for his own sin. But in the Bible, the sin was entirely put on the woman. So that's the first strike against women. The second thing, the Christians started to realize that Jesus... Uh, well, I mean, obviously they, knew, they, they said that Jesus never got married. So they saw that he was celibate. He never got married. So they concluded that it's probably the best to not get married. And so they invented celibacy into their religion. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, وَرَحْبَانِيَّةً ibtadauha," And celibacy which they innovated into the religion. Allah didn't command them. They imposed it upon themselves to be celibate, to not get married. Why? Because Jesus never got married. So he is our best example. He never got married. We see the woman being the source of evil in the Bible. And so they start to conclude that women were evil. If you ever wonder why it took the West so long to consider the woman as a full human being. If you ever wonder why the West took so long to finally allow women to vote and to give them some, so many of their rights. And it, this is recent as far as the West is concerned. Relatively recently, they finally got the rights to vote and to be a full human being and so on and so forth. Why? It goes back to these teachings, seeing women as uh, evil. Okay? 
as an extension of this, and you're going to see things spiraling and getting worse and worse and worse. As a result of this, of women being evil, they concluded that yeah, and you can get married because you need to have children, but to be intimate with your wife is not a good thing either. So they saw uh, intimacy with the wife, intercourse, things like that, as dirty. They regarded it as a dirty thing, a bad thing. And they said the only time you can be intimate with the wife is if you want children. If you don't want children, don't do it. Because you're not supposed to enjoy it. It's a bad thing. It's a dirty thing. Why is it a bad thing? Because the women are evil. And because Jesus never did it. It's a bad thing. And this goes on until in America, until today, we have very strange laws. I, I don't want to mes mention them. We're in the house of Allah and there's some sisters here. Some very, very strange laws. All of them stemming back from this. Taban, these laws exist today in the law books, but they're not... Um, they're not implemented whatsoever. Few people even know they're in the law books. But if you want to have some fun, just write, just Google search strange laws in America. You'll find some strange things. And you may run across some of these strange ones as well. So, then what happens, they're, they're continuing with this thought process. Then they see in the Quran, when now they encounter Muslims, they find that Muslims don't view intimacy as something dirty or something shameful or something bad, but it's something good between a man and the wife, yani, and it's permissible and it's a source of enjoyment. They found that in the Quran, Allah, right after the verses speaking about i'tikaf um, in Ramadan, will mention going back to the wife. So it was very normal, it's even put in the middle of verses about acts of worship. They saw that the man can marry up to four, they saw that the man gets virgins in a Jannah and 72 virgins and all this issue. Yeah? And they concluded that Muslim men are oversexed. That's why they get all this. Yani. And they even said that Muslim women wear hijab because the men are wild and if they see them, they will attack them. They really said this stuff, right? So they concluded that Muslim men were oversexed. Why? Now, some of you are old enough to remember the, the movies, the old movies, where how did they always portray the Arab in the old movies? Who remembers this? Old movies, huh? Naam? Aywa, always with females, always wanting females. <laughs> All the movies like this. The whole, this construct of Hollywood of the harem, the harem, yeah? That the, the Sultan will have all these women in very, very bad clothing, yeah? Their belly is showing everything very uncovered, but mashallah, they still wear naqab, yeah? <laughs> what kind of sense does that make? She has haya. She's not a bad woman. <laughs> right? Kind of an idea, what kind of Islam is this? And then the man comes, he's just picking from the woman. This is the Sultan. You over there, come here. You, come. You three, come. Khalas is a crazy Arab man, wants a lot of women. In a lot of the movies, even until the 80s, the Arab is always the one with bad broken teeth. His eye, one eye is looking this way, the other one is looking that way. And always, he's always asking women, how much? How much? Every movie was like that. Even some of the more recent movies, I'm not going to mention titles. By the way, this is related to my field of study, okay? It is. <laughs> um... I'll tell you something interesting, just since I mentioned my field of study about portrayal of people in movies. Um, one of our professors, he was saying that if you look at a lot of the movies, the bad guy had what kind of accent before 9-11? The bad guy. What accent? Russian accent. And what? German. Almost every bad guy in a movie, he spoke with a German English accent or a Russian accent. Always. Russian, still the effects of the Cold War. They were the enemy. So every bad guy speaks like a Russian. Yeah? And then what happens? Uh, Germany, still the effects of World War II. And every bad guy is a German still. Then the professor said, this was right after 9-11. He said something interesting. He said, now you will notice from now onwards, all the bad guys in movies will have, what kind of accent? Arab accent. And Allah, he was so right about that. That sometimes even a, a person who is non-Arab is given an Arab accent. One time I was working at home and someone was watching television. And I heard uh, an American guy speaking to a guy that sounded just like an Arab. 
So these issues of discrimination are important to me. So I looked up. I started watching this clip. And they're, you know, both of each one has a gun and they're hiding behind the wall. He's like, surrender, ma surrender, and muhim. The guy with the Arab access, okay, I surrender, I'm going to come out. And out comes out a black African guy. The black African guy, now they gave him an Arab accent. So, because this is the new bad guy, the Arab. But that was a totally, any yani different side note here. But it was related to <laughs> the portrayal of a people in the media. And the Arab was always portrayed as sex, oversexed and hungry, like that. Always asked, how much? You, how much? All the time. So then what happens, then the Western world goes through what is known as the sexual revolution. In the 19, from, that started from the 1960s all the way to the 1980s, they experienced what is known as the sexual revolution. Where they started to, to accept uh, any intimate relations outside of marriage, became very acceptable. And all kinds of other things became very acceptable and homosexuality became very acceptable. So they started to then go through this phase known as the sexual revolution. And now again the Muslims were at the ex other extreme end. Realistically, we were always here. We never moved from here. We were always here. But they're the ones who kept moving around. So when they were very far to the right, they looked at the Muslims and said, Oh, you guys are so far to the left. Then they came very far to the left and they looked back at the Muslims and said, you guys are so far to the right. But realistically, we're in the same place. We didn't go anywhere, right? <laughs> Our standards were the same. Our hijab and, and rules were the same. So now they go through the sexual revolution. They go very far to the left. And now we're so far to the right. And again, they start to critique the Muslims. You Muslims, look how you cover these women. First, they said the women have to cover themselves because the men are crazy. They'll attack them. Now, after the sexual revolution, you're oppressing these women by covering them. Let them uncover. They're against every rule of segregation, not intermingling, men and women not touching each other. All of that now is suddenly very offensive to them. But subhanAllah, despite that fact, and here, if some of you are ever confused, why are they against the Muslim man having four wives? Why? Because it's a strange combination of the old thoughts and the new thoughts. Because you would think, yani if you look at the Western society, let's just now stereotype and say, they're, um, yani, how do I put this nicely? Yani sexual activity is a very big deal there. They're very promiscuous for the most part, very promiscuous. Exchanging partners and things like that. A man will be married, he'll always he'll have mistresses and cheat on his wife. But you would think that they'll be okay with the idea of four wives in Islam. You would think so. That they'll always come to us, hey Muslim, huh? MashaAllah. Mm -hmm. MashaAllah. I like that. That's one thing. I don't like you guys very much, but I like that you guys can, huh? Because they really like that stuff. So they should like the fact that Muslims get married to four, shouldn't they? No, because it's a combination of old thoughts that they can't get away with. So the old thought was, oh my God, look at them. They have four wives. How disgusting. Then they went overboard, but they still kept that old thought instead of appreciating the fact that we can have four wives. You would think they would become Muslim because they want women, right? But not that. Uh, if you remember after 9-11, well, and maybe you were aware of this, but in America you, you were forced to be aware of this. After 9-11, it was a big deal and all over the news and newspapers and internet that look at these people, they believe that they go to Jannah and they get 72 virgins. And how can you believe? By the way, the Christians, because they saw uh, sexual relations as something dirty, they were forced to say that Jannah is spiritual. Jannah is spiritual. Even though in, the, in their writings, in their books, in their movies, they always show Jannah as physical. How can Jannah be spiritual? How do you enjoy it if you're a spirit? How do you relax on a cushion if you're a spirit? How do you drink if you're a spirit? You, know, you come grab the water. What's the matter with this thing? Huh? They pour it for you, it spills, ya Allah. How do you enjoy yourself if you're a spirit? They forced to say Jannah is spiritual because that you can't have physical enjoyment because physical enjoyment is dirty. How, how do we know it's dirty? One, women are evil. Two, Jesus never did it. So it's a bad thing. That means it's not in Jannah. So they were forced to say Jannah is spiritual. You see all the problems that happen? All the problems, one pushing the next, one pushing the other. And so, now, when they, when they came and saw that, after 9-11, this issue of the 72 virgins, and it was such a big deal. And everyone was like, what is this? What kind of belief is this? That you get virgins in Jannah and all this stuff. And of course, a lot of pressure was put on imams, and some of them broke. 
And some of them said al-hur, al-ain. It's uh, cotton flowers. Cotton flowers. Cotton flowers. So when Allah says, وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ بِحُورٍ عِينٍ We wed them to hurin عِينٍ يعني We wed them, we married them off to cotton flowers. What are you going to do with the cotton flower, ya I don't know about you, I don't want any cotton flowers. What kind of statement is this? Why? Because they were pressured now. And they were ashamed of it. And they started to say, um, 72 virgin, 71, 70 virgin, 72. Yeah? Akhi. No, there is, this is something that you guys, you guys, not you, the Westerners, you tell them, you guys love this so much. And every movie and every magazine and every advertisement you talk about sexuality, you bring up sexuality every time, all day, all night. And now you want to make it like and it's something wrong with it. If you enjoy it so much, you love it so much, <laughs> wouldn't you be rewarded with something that's good in, 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 the, in paradise? Why are you so against this idea? That's why we said we have this strange dichotomy before, between the old thoughts and the new thought. So they had the sexual revolution and they moved to another level, but they still kept some of the old things. Still hate the issue of you guys have four wives. Still hate the issue of, you know, you guys will experience that in a Jannah. And we don't have this teaching and so on and so forth. So now intermingling is an issue. Not shaking hands is an issue. Hijab uh, is an issue. And that's why today when a nun is dressed just like a Muslim woman, she's not oppressed. An Orthodox woman comes, her hair is covered, she's not oppressed, but the, woman, the minute the Muslim woman walks by, oh, you see, she's oppressed. That is the history behind all this strange uh, mentality and strange way of looking at the attire of Muslim women. Um, and in the end, we, we advise the, the Muslim women to not allow themselves to be oppressed by those who want to liberate them. You understand? Don't be oppressed by those who claim they want to liberate you. And always stand up and let them know, first of all, I don't need you to defend me, okay? I don't need you to fight for me. And if I were oppressed, I would have done something myself about it. You know, consider millions of Muslims, for example, living in Western lands, and millions of them wearing their hijab, the Muslim women, wearing their hijab, wearing their niqab, and they're comfortable with it. So if they were not comfortable with it, they can take it off and the laws would defend them there. There's no sharia in America. They could take off the hijab and move out of the, the father's home by the age 18. The minute they hit 18, they can move out. And he could, would have no legal recourse whatsoever. So they can do that, but they don't. That means they choose to wear this out of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not me who needs to uncover, it's you who needs to cover. So you're looked at as a person, as a human being, and not as a sexual object. I don't have the, I'm liberated from that. The Muslim woman should say, I am liberated from that, and you're not. You are the one in bondage. You are the one in slavery still. You are the one who has a problem, and you cannot break free from these shackles. Putting on the hijab helps you break free from these shackles. So don't allow someone to come to you and put you in the lesser position and tell you that you need to be liberated. They need to liberate themselves from the shackles of this kind of uh, uh, being looked at as an object. One of the, um, one of the Muslim women one time during one of the da'wah workshops, she, she wears niqab and she said, sometimes I'm at the, at the cashier, at the register, at a store, and when we're finishing, at, at the end, at the last second, the woman gives me the money and she says, and, and why do you wear that, by the way? She says, I don't have any time to explain to her. What can I say? I said, okay, do this next time. Because now at the, at the register in America, when you're leaving, they have all these magazines. And every magazine has a woman that's not dressed properly on it. So she said, how can I explain to her in just two seconds? The customer behind me, she's already ringing their items. How do I explain to her in a few seconds why I'm wearing niqab? She said, next time, just point to the magazine and say, so I don't become like that. And walk away. So the Muslim woman is the one who is truly liberated from Allah, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't allow people to put you in the lesser position but you're the one in the higher position the position of the educator so the person that you're supposed to educate is coming to educate you no you listen and I speak and I direct you to the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we'll end here inshallah I would like to thank all of you for coming and for your attentive listening Jazakumullah khairan wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh